Um, now I'll hand over to uh, the Chair of uh, Climate Action Monero, Jenny Gold, who will um, do the introductions tonight. Where is Jenny gone? Jenny, Jenny. Just doing it, Jenny. Never here. <laughs> oh, you've got yourself good. Yes. Hi, everyone. I, my name is Jenny Goldie. I'm President of Climate Action Monero. Along with Farmers for Climate Action, uh, we're hosting tonight's seminar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Narago people, traditional custodians of the land on which some of us are gathered today. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Islanders on this webinar today, also paying my respects to your elders past, present and emerging. I'll now hand over to Wendy Cohen, CEO of Farmers for Climate Action, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to be here this evening and to present uh, this wonderful opportunity to engage with Zali and ask some questions and hear a bit more about her vision and, and play a small part in galvanising um, the, the, the spirit and the interest in climate action that the uh, uh, people in, in Monaro have and it's um, it's wonderful to be working alongside so many um, passionate and committed uh, volunteers um, such as Jenny and Joe Oddie I see here as well and, and many other familiar faces that I can see. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Farmers for Climate Action, we're a movement uh, of farmers around the country passionate about, committed to climate action um, and we work alongside farmers to elevate their voice, to tell the stories of uh, uh, being at the coalface of climate change, um, experiencing the impacts, having to weather the storm, to, to use a, um, a, a tried and true pun, but uh, very much um, the, the, the uh, engaging and wonderful element of farmers for climate action and working with farmers is that not only do we bring experience of the farmers uh, to, to politicians and, and further afield into the, into the public domain, but we come bearing solutions. And ours is very much uh, an evidence-based position that we come from. And we know what needs to be done on farm. We know what can be done in farming communities across the country um, to mitigate climate change, to assist businesses, farmers, rural and regional Australians to transition into embracing low carbon solutions, uh, solutions involving renewable energy uh, and, uh, and um, capturing soil and ensuring that emissions um, are uh, limited as much as possible with a view to meeting targets set by Paris Accord um, that the politicians around the country at the state level at, very, at the very least have embraced net zero targets for 2030, for example, and really acknowledging the fabulous work that Zali is doing at the federal level to really uh, elevate climate as the key issue. Uh, and we've seen evidence of that um, earlier this year when Zali brought the uh, climate bill um, to life in parliament. Um, sadly, I think climate and the debate around the importance for climate policy and the, the um, demand that we've had as a country that we have national leadership on climate has, I believe, been uh, somewhat subsumed by the COVID crisis that we all face. On the back of the extraordinarily uh, devastating bushfires, I think that we've probably not had the opportunity to really um, capture the, the public's imagination as much as we needed to and, and, and get the media bandwidth, for example to ensure that climate action was remained front and centre coming out of that terrible summer that we've just gone through. Uh, climate um, uh, action is the, the cornerstone and, 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 and the key driver of uh, a, re, um, a regional horizon. Re, say that again, sorry. Regional horizons, which is our uh, key program that Farmers for Climate Action is calling for. Uh, four key recommendations um, of our federal leaders and the government to provide a stimulus uh, supporting 
uh, rural and regional Australia listening to their needs and appreciating that rural and regional Australia has a very strong and important role to play in the recovery post COVID-19. And uh, I would urge you all, I think I will actually pop the link for that into the chat for you all too. I'd love for you to read that document. Uh, and there is um, <coughs> coming out of that document that I'd be really interested um, for you to follow, uh, indeed, contacting MPs, for example, but really elevating the call for climate policy with the candidates in Edmonaro. Um, so we uh, are really keen to continue to work with you as much as possible to assist to elevate that call for climate action locally and more broadly that we're always uh, there on, on, the, on the forefront of uh, advocating for climate action. So uh, thank you again so much for your interest and uh, Jenny for that kind introduction. I'll throw it back to you now to introduce the reason that we're all really here in Zali. And Zali, I just wanted to again thank you personally for all that you do for um, tackling climate change. Thanks, Wendy. Um, as I said earlier, Climate Action Monero is co-hosting this webinar. We were established in 2011 um, to educate the public and decision makers about the science of climate change. And I hope that is something that we have done. Um, at the end of this uh, webinar, um, Jo Dodds, whom, who, who has organized this webinar, and I thank her very much for it. She will show a screen where uh, you, which shows the um, uh, the websites for both Farmers for Climate Action and Climate Action Monero. As you know, we're in the middle of the Eden Monero by-election and our two organisations hope that visitors will elect a candidate who's committed to strong climate action, for we are indeed in the middle of a climate crisis. I don't know whether you've seen on the news, but a town in Siberia within the Arctic Circle this week recorded over 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or 38 degrees. The first time a town in, within the Arctic Circle has recorded so high a temperature. And also in the news this week, uh, we heard that we're heading for not two or three or four, but five degrees uh, warming, which would be absolutely catastrophic. Uh, but uh, my role now is to introduce Zali. Um, I do so with great pleasure. Zali Stegall OAM is the independent federal member for the seat of Warringah in Sydney's north. She's also Sydney's, uh, sorry, Australia's most successful alpine skier, winning the bronze medal in slalom at the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, and a world championship gold medal in 1999. From 2008, Zali was a practicing barrister, specializing in commercial law, sports law, and family law. In 2019, last year, Zali contested the federal parliamentary seat of Warringah as an independent candidate. The seat had been held for 25 years uh, by former Prime Minister, the Honorable Tony Abbott. On the 18th of May, Zali won the seat with a two candidate preferred vote of over 57%, an extraordinary figure. For those of us in the climate movement, this was a tremendous relief. Since in purely climate terms, Mr. Abbott was a disaster. When he took office in 2013, he set about dismantling many of the excellent initiatives that had come out of the Gillard, Gillard minority government, not least the carbon price, which we all know significantly reduced emissions. In the year or so since she's been in office, Sally has worked hard on a number of issues, but particularly on climate change, introducing her Climate Change Bill 2020 in February. Because of the COVID pandemic, it has had to be delayed, but I'll let Zali speak to that. I now warmly welcome her and ask her to say a few words. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh for all those kind words and 
well done for everyone to be here. This is the important first step is actually being here looking for the conversation and how you can be involved. Um, I will start off by also acknowledging uh, the country and uh, the uh, Gayamagal, the Gamaragal and the Borogagal, the first people of Warringah, where I stand. Um, and may we learn from our First Nations people about how to care for the land and, and for the elders of the future to work together, I think, hopefully, with a little more unity and more um, uh, foresight on what, what we're trying to be and what Australia can be. Um, I think, uh, for me, I was going to start by, I guess, talking a little bit about the, the journey that, that gets me here. And like you mentioned, the 2019 federal election clearly uh, was very important, but it's also for what it represented here in Warringah. Um, I decided to leave my professional career as a barrister um, because I felt that we needed better representation in Canberra. I really felt Warringah deserved a, a bit more choice and a, and a different voice. I felt that um, regardless of how anyone had voted in the past and whether, you know, what their, their views were or where their political affiliation was, there was a sense that for true democracy to work, for representation to work, you actually needed a, a member to represent the views of the constituents and the electorate. And I actually think, especially with where you all find yourselves now in Eden Monero, um, in relation to an election coming up, is that has to be the key point, is who is actually going to be true to your values and what matters to your electorate. So in uh, Warringah, whilst it had been held by the Liberal Party for many years, 25 years, um, my entire voting life, it had been held by, by Tony Abbott, ironically, um, there was a growing sense of disquiet that when it came to important issues, it, he was not interested in representing the electorate or the majority view of the electorate. And we saw that gradually over time and it grew and grew as far as that community feeling that there should be more representation. Um, I think it's that conflict of does party come before electorate, you know, what, when does the electorate uh, take priority? Um, and there was some key issues that really mattered. And we had seen a number of community groups grow in Moringa that really wanted to um, first sit, you know, the conversations around the kitchen table. So that movement grew out of uh, Indi, Voices of Indi, where Cathy McGowan was the independent member uh, for eight years, um, or for two terms, I should say. Um, and um, it's having those conversations where you start talking about the topics, what are the issues that matter, what's your position, and really seeking to understand why, what's the part that matters. So that created a great community engagement around Warringah where people were proud to show their colours is the best way I can describe the 2019 campaign. Now, there were a few, three key elements we had in the campaign. It was the three Ps of our campaign, which was always be positive. So our focus was not about what the other side represented or what they were doing. Our focus was what we were offering. What were we going to be about? We were not interested in delving into the negative. Because at the end of the day, you're asking people in the electorate who have voted for that member to change their vote. And to change their vote, it doesn't mean telling them you were wrong in the past. It's simply saying, I'm offering a different future. And is this more, more in line with what, how would you, you would like to be represented? So that first P of being positive was really important. And I had a number of volunteers who found it really interesting that they were really keen to get stuck into the issue and reprimand or look at the past and instead it was about looking at to the future what what was the positive policy we wanted to put forward the second p would be prepared because um, you have to cover you know it's like running a business running a campaign or a community group you really have to think about um, what you're trying to achieve, who you have to convince, how are you going to touch as many people as possible, how do you get your message out, and this is where your website is your shop front, you need to have good community engagement, and you need to be prepared with the policy positions and how you deal with people that have different views, so that you always stay true to the first P, which was being positive. 
Um, and then being polite. So for a lot of people in Warringah, they had never been involved in, an, uh, in a political campaign, had never been part of a political party and never marched or done that kind of activism. And yet we had 1,400 volunteers by the end for the campaign. And that was because people were actually having fun. Um, it was a community of all ages, all socio-demographics, -de um, coming together around issues and sort of questions of principle of what they really all believed in. Um, and so we had people wearing t-shirts to do their supermarket shopping, to pick up their kids from school. Uh, we had a huge number of people prepared to put core flutes in their gardens. So usually you see core flutes, you know, competition to get them up on signposts. We had people willing to show their colours, put them in your garden. Now it's private property, you know, it's a whole different position to having to put them on public land. So it really showed how much this was community led. This was about everybody being on board. Um, I've never seen so many photos of myself around the electorate, but it was really lovely to see that it engaged the whole community. Um, because as an independent, there's no doubt you can't do it on your own. Like, it's just not possible. Um, you have to be there as a representative of the community and I really felt that was really important. Um, so a key, key issues for an electorate like Warringah were uh, climate policy. Um, it's generally a fiscally conservative electorate, I guess having voted Liberal, you know, it's been a Liberal seat for 25 years, but wanting uh, good policies on integrity, strong desire for National Integrity Commission, strong desire for truth in political advertising, for example, uh, better refugee policy and strong action on climate. So really looking at what is our legacy, what are our ethical and you know, core principles of what kind of Australia do we want to be? Um, so they were really key issues for Warringah. Um, and I think they are true for most electorates. If you really sat around the kitchen table with most people, what are the issues that you would say are your core values that you would want to pass on to the next generations or that you would want to really represent you? And whether you're urban or regional um, Australia, I, I do think we are united around some core principles. Um, and so rather than focus on what divides us, especially around climate policy and my predecessor was a very divisive figure in climate policy and politics. He weaponised climate politics. He, would, he made no, um, no secret that for him, 2013, it was about dividing people around climate policy. It wasn't about looking at the long-term welfare of Australia. It wasn't about looking at the science. It was pure, I think, personal political gain. Um, and I think we need to be bigger than that and communities need to be bigger than that. Um, so I guess it, it took some time, but I think it has culminated around many um, electorates. And I think organisations like Farmers for Climate Action are doing so much in regional Australia to get that sense of where do we want to be? What are the concerns? Um, what's been interesting um, around... Um, talking around climate is trying to understand so people who don't believe in climate change or that man may man has an impact why but do or do they at least accept the changes that we're seeing in the weather the fact that there is global warming what that means for regional australia longer droughts uh, more more severe bushfire seasons um, you know we've got much more risks of extreme weather events I saw the articles about the heat temperatures in the uh, Arctic um, they are really frightening all those impacts um, and there's no doubt that regional Australia will be at the forefront of impacts in terms of suffering the consequences as I know you already did this summer with the bushfires I mean um, you know I spend a lot of time in Jindabyne and in the mountains I know how much the whole region was impacted so it's about trying to put aside maybe political parties and really looking to the the issues and the values so 
we've been in, I've been in Parliament now a bit over a year and I still see myself as very much, a, you know, a professional with a look into the political life. I don't know that I describe myself as a politician yet. Um, I was very focused on trying to breaking the impasse on climate politics um, stop for, to get people to stop thinking of it as a left or right issue yes labor has in the past has had better policies and is committed to better policies and has implemented better policies but if we continually position it as a left or right issue we don't bring the majority of australians forward we need to bring i think on any issue you need you know a good 80 percent support gets us there um, the Australian Institute has done research and shows that there is 80% in the Australian population support for stronger climate action. Now that means you have both uh, Labor voters and coalition voters supporting stronger action. What is it going to take for that to be more of a driving force at each election? You know, do you put your economic policy before you put your environment policy of candidates? How do you rate your issues? Um, and so for me, the most important thing was trying to take the political positioning of climate away and think of it as this is actually an issue that impacts all of us. It should not be a left or right issue. Um, and it's, it should be a common goal. So the climate change bill that I've uh, worked on and I uh, was due to introduce it in March um, because sadly I expected that we were going to have a bad summer. Um, I've got to say the summer was worse than anything I anticipated, but I did expect us to have a bad summer uh, because of record temperatures and drought. And so I was due to present the bill in March, but I've delayed that because of the crisis and the coronavirus, and I'm due to present it later in the year. That was really frustrating in that we had built up a lot of momentum and there was a lot of pressure on the government, um, especially in relation, you know, after the bushfires had, did not do a good job on, on the bushfires. We clearly, the government had ignored reports and warnings. Uh, I met with the fire chiefs both uh, in uh, several times. I met with Greg Mullins. He discussed with me where the concerns were and the risks were, and they were very real risks with very real recommendations that needed to be implemented. And I don't understand that any of them were. So that's a real, you know, practical concern. Um, now, having to delay it from March has been a good and a bad thing. Uh, as you said uh, in your opening comments, Jenny, it's taken, well, it's taken it off the front of mind maybe a little bit because of the health crisis and now the economic crisis. But I think it also has, uh, I don't think it's taken climate away because what we've seen with the coronavirus is a focus on uh, we've got a health crisis and we've sh it has shown what the impact of a pandemic can do to an economy that whilst we're in Ireland, we're not isolated from what happens in the rest of the world. Um, and we know one of the impacts of climate change will be a greater risk of pandemics um, and, and global health concerns. Um, the other aspect has been that our economy is not immune to what happens in the rest of the world. We are going to be impacted. So you have to, uh, we're not a big enough economy to, to go it alone. We're going to have to go with what happens around the world. Now, what we've seen with the economic crisis of the coronavirus is that all countries and the EU in particular are looking at what does their stimulus look like? Now, if you're going to be spending sizable amounts of public money on your stimulus, it needs to tick a few boxes. It can't be spent on ideology. It has to be spent on long-term benefit. Um, we've, we know we have a massive climate risk, financial risk in the future um, in terms of what the climate impacts will do. Um, and that has to be dealt with. Now, I asked the Prime Minister in question time, you know, has the government costed the impact of a two degree warming world on our economy, on jobs, on industry. And he acknowledged, no, they haven't. They haven't costed that. Now, as you said, we're not even talking about a two degree world, we're talking about a five degree world. Um, now we know in the UK, the Stern Review did, uh, did the numbers on what that does to your economy and it's devastating. So 
when we look at all these stimulus packages for the economic recovery post coronavirus, there is an imperative that they make sense for the long-term economic benefit of the country. We're seeing the EU have announced a 750 billion euro package that is linked to low carbon lowering emissions and any projects that gets funding has to disclose carbon risk and climate risk. So, so carbon emissions and climate risk. So it is linked that the recovery packages from this virus must accomplish and work with and work towards the goal of lowering emissions. In Canada, large corporations were not entitled to coronavirus subsidy and rescue package with that if they were not participated in the TCFD, which is disclosing your climate risk impact. So many countries around the world are in the process of dealing with this virus and pandemic are moving on their climate policy and lowering emissions. So the Australian government has still been very focused on gas led recovery, which is just wrong. Uh, they, are, they, they have moved the talk away from coal, but they are still trying to sort of sell on an ideology base that it should be a gas-led recovery. Now, the numbers don't stack up. The private sector will not invest in that. It will require huge amounts of public fund subsidy to do that. Um, and that is purely investing in ideology, not in a sensible economic future, let alone environmental future. Um, so that's where it's really important. A group like you, like climate, like climate, so farmers for climate action. And I, I've actually had someone say to me that you should also be talking about being farmers for climate economy um, because from for many regional uh, producers there is great opportunity with large renewables from wind farms from um, so large solar panels farms uh, to work with agricultural land um, and work in tandem with regional Australia so I think there is great opportunity the key is focusing on where they are and how to deliver them um, I guess I would say finally, the only way we can do that is more voices like mine in par Parliament. Um, I am one voice. Uh, a lot of people say independent, how, you know, how much can an independent do? Well, I would argue we can do a lot because we are, I am directly responsible uh, and answerable to my electorate. So I represent what the electorate brings to me. I don't have an ulterior agenda. I don't have a party rule telling me what I can and can't say. So you really have that ability to change the debate and put forward solutions. Um, so I guess what I would say about the election in Eden Monaro is um, a lot of promises get made at election time. And the question is how much do you truly believe they will be true to those promises? Um, what is the track record of actually being able to speak out, especially if you're looking at candidates from party, major parties? Will the, is, that the line, is that major party taking a, a real line on necessary action or are they really, you know, not, not, not towing the line? So, and I think in an electorate like Eden Monaro where you are so at the forefront of the impacts, this is a self-interest question. You, you know, you really should be worrying about how, you know, how are you going to prepare, mitigate, assess your risk, mitigate, um, and address the risk. You know, sure, there's a question of getting uh, resilient, but I think you have to, and, and there's a level of adaptation, but we must be mitigating the risk. But I've probably gone on for longer than I have, should have, and you've got questions, so far away. <laughs> um, thank you, Zali. Um, Jenny Gold is going to ask some questions. I'll just point out that um, whilst we're partners in this operation at Farmers for Climate Action, Climate Action Monero is actually a, a separate group and it's their, um, it was at their instigation that this happened. So uh, they're sort of local in the, the Monero electorate. So I'll hand over to Jenny to ask the first couple of questions and then we have quite a few others. Uh, where is Jenny? Unmute. Come on, work machine, unmute. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks, Sally, that was terrific. We did, I did have some questions, but you've largely answered most of them. 
And I note that there are quite a lot of um, questions from the audience. Um, I was going to say, how did the voters of Warringah organise themselves to get you as a candidate? I don't know that you've exactly answered <laughs> that one. Um, you did sort of talk about kitchen table meetings and that kind of thing, as they did in Indi, which, you know, provided a splendid um, example of how to do it. But could you just elaborate a little bit more about how the voters chose you to be an independent okay. candidate? Um, well, look, I think throughout 2018, there was a growing sense of unease, I would say, what happened with um, Malcolm Turnbull, maybe the part uh, the local member <laughs> in Warringah played in that, um, the, maybe the destructive nature of the, uh, and the instability. Um, there was the dissatisfaction around how um, Tony represented our view on the same-sex marriage vote. That was a big driver again. So we had a number of issues. In terms of me personally, I guess I had never felt particularly represented by his views um, on, on certain issues. So um, I felt strongly that it was time for change in Moringa. Uh, as a barrister, I've always been very attracted to, you know, you, you get, you do the research, you, you get the brief in terms of what are the issues, what is the best argument for them. Um, I was fit, I was like many in Moringa watching who there were many groups um, and many different candidates being spoken of. Um, I felt strongly that I was attracted to there being a female representative, um, and we were getting towards the end of 2018, and I wasn't com convinced that we had the right people or that anyone really was prepared to stand up and do it. Now, I was really upset when, for example, Julie Bishop wasn't given a proper run at the leadership ballot after the spill with Malcolm Turnbull. Um, you know, I, I just felt that we needed a change of attitude in politics. And I really felt that if someone like me wasn't prepared to give it a go, then how could I criticise anyone else not to be prepared to give it a go? Um, I've dealt with the media in my sporting life. I've had 10 years of advocacy at the bar in a fairly patriarchal environment. I'm used to it being pretty tough at the bar table in front of the judges. Um, so I've, and, and I'm a mother of teenagers, so I feel really concerned about their future and what our legacy is going to be. I'm really frustrated that the climate debate was just still going on, that we still weren't progressing towards solutions. Um, so I felt that it was really time for me to step up, that there's no point on raging at the TV and, uh, and complaining about the state of affairs, that I needed to step in and put myself on the line. Um, and again, it's about giving people choice. Um, people needed to then, you know, feel that I properly represented them um, and, and feel comfortable with that choice. So that was the, the decision process for me to put my hand forward. And then we had a long campaign. We went from uh, 27th of January was when we did the announcement and then the election was the 18th of May. So I gave up my practice as a barrister and worked full time on the campaign. We put together a really professional team. We got professional consultants to help us. Um, and we, we had a dedicated team of volunteers that worked tirelessly for four and a half solid months. Um, and, and as I said, people, you know, it was about, um, I think the positive and polite was a really important part of it, that this wasn't about divisive politics. It was about um, trying to find a different option. So being, you know, the, the, and that's why people were prepared to wear their T-shirts, you know, shopping and walking this, you know, we had people walking around Manly Beach and Balmoral and around Manly Dam all the time in T-shirts. Um, it was just, it was really um, across the community um, and it was incredibly positive. Okay, thank you. And you also had dinosaurs on the street, which is, <laughs> made had dinosaurs, laugh, yes. which is um, really good. I might just go to one more question from me before going to um, the people on this um, uh, hookup. How can the voters of Eden Monero call candidates to account with regard to the urgency and scale of climate action required? 
Yeah, I think it's really important that you have to be convinced of the candidates of what their what the policy is. But more than that, are they just saying it now because it's an election time, or can you trust that they're going to be true to that position? Now, I would say, you know, you've got the individual characteristics of that person and their character and integrity, but you've also got a pattern of what happens in other electorates within parties. So, you know, it's one thing to say it before the election. It's a question of, okay, but what are you really going to do? So if you believe in stronger action on climate, are you prepared to cross the floor? Will you support a conscience vote? If your party room cannot... Um, come to the party with more progressive policy on climate, what will you do? Because it's not good enough if all they're going to do is advocate in the party room and then stay silent. Um, and I'd have to say my frustration is with the coalition at the moment in terms of the moderate Liberals who they talk a big game at elections, but they don't deliver once they're in. Um, it really doesn't get to anything if you're as good as a denier if you're not prepared to stand up for the issue. Um, and I think, you know, the time for sort of being nice about that, you know, it really is, we can't afford to wait. As the temperatures show, we have the next 10 years to put in place some very important policies. Um, look, I don't believe we're going to get to net zero like what the Greens would argue for in some, you know, very tight time frame. But what I do strongly believe in is we need to lock in our line in the sand of our net zero by 2050. Now, we know from our, the Paris Agreement, the IPCC has said we need to get to net zero before 2050 to have any chance of staying under two degrees. And to be fair, the, the evidence is starting to show that it's going to need to be sooner than that. But we've got state governments prepared to commit to 2050, both coalition and Labor state governments. So ideologically, it should not be impossible. Um, we need that line in the sand to create the drivers to get there. So, and then you need, you need a, a map, a pathway of how, a plan on how to get there. And that's what the Climate Change Bill offers. It's five year emission reduction targets to get to that 2050. Because I always give the analogy is if you plan to run a marathon, you can't just tomorrow turn up and say, right, I'm going to run 42 Ks. But if you set yourself that, right, over the course of three months or six months, I'm going to go from running 500 metres to a kilometre to five to 10 to 15, you will get there. It will be achievable. Um, and so we need to set that path. And at the moment, we haven't. Um, current government policy is on track. We're only achieving 14% reduction by 2030. They want to use carryover credits. Um, we don't have significant enough policy certainty to really drive private investment and ensure that we actually accelerate on lower emission technologies. Um, so policy certainty is really important. Private sectors getting on with it, a lot of private investment going into um, net zero uh, by 2050, a lot of private companies committing to that, but we need the, at federal level, we need government policy to be locked in. And I think if we can peel it back, what does it really mean? Net zero by 2050 means that we are complying with the Paris Agreement, but it also means that we're openly saying, I actually want a livable planet for the future. I want a chance at a livable planet for the future. I think that is something, regardless of your political ideology, everyone should be able to sign up to. Um, so I think that's really important. So in the context of your candidates, I would be absolutely grilling them and getting them on the record so that whoever gets in, they are accountable for those promises and they're on the record. And it is up to every, each and every person in the community to hold them to those promises. It's not good enough to just let a politician sell you a story at the election and then not hold them to account for the next two years and then be open for another story. Um, look, at the moment, the rumour is we could be facing another federal election in October 2021. So next year, we could be up again. Um, and how much has been achieved between May 2019 to then? I would say very little. And so there has to be a, some accountability. Thanks very much, Sally. Um, I would say that we have got one candidate, Joy Angel, here tonight, and I welcome her from Sustainable Australia. 
we would have had more candidates, but unfortunately, Farmers Federation have organised a candidates meeting for tonight. So thank you, Joy, for turning up for this one instead. <laughs> um, I'm now going to hand back to Peter Holding, who's going to field the questions. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jenny. Um, right, I have a first question from um, Jed. Uh, great work on climate action now. When will, when will the climate action be represented to Parliament, which you've sort of gone into? The main part of it, what do you see as the main threats to getting it passed? Okay. Well, my plan is to get it uh, presented probably uh, later in the year, probably sometime probably after the budget. Um, my thinking around that is I've now got a six-week break between Parliament sitting and then we've got four weeks in August and then there's again a long break in September and then October is the budget. Um, so I've incorporated, I've made some changes to the climate bill in terms of incorporating the government's technology roadmap, draft paper, but technology roadmap, um, and uh, some of its elements in terms of its um, low emission technology statements and reporting mechanisms. So I would argue that the Climate Change Bill is a legislative framework that is needed to give effect to that technology roadmap um, and hold it accountable. Um, so I will present that in November, uh, November, October, November. We'll see how we're going with the dates. But um, to get it passed, well, the, government, the coalition has a majority of two in the lower house. So I need, um, my ask is simple. Uh, I think it should be a conscience vote to free it from the party room. I think there are people within the coalition party room that will never accept that climate change is an issue um, and that are prepared to risk the stability of government to get their way. And I don't believe it's good democracy that government would, should be held to ransom by a couple of disruptive voices. So I think if you elevate it to a moral issue, a question of a free vote, a conscience vote, then every MP can be true to whatever position and promise they made to their electorate and actually vote accordingly. So a conscience vote allows everyone to vote in accordance with um, their, the, their beliefs and, and the, the promises they've made to the electorate. If I can't get the government to accept a conscience vote, I mean, I shouldn't backtrack. The first thing would be great if the government can accept it as policy and come on board with a net zero by 2050 plan. Um, raising it to a conscience vote would have that similar effect. Um, the alternative is that two people would need to cross the floor. Uh, now, they will only do that if they feel absolutely at risk of re-election, that the community, their community and their electorates feel so strongly on the issue that unless they are true to their position, they have a very strong risk of losing their seat. Now, there's a number of seats that we're targeting um, and that we know the population um, feel strongly about climate. Um, tend to be more urban seats, I have to say, but I feel strongly that regional seats should also be feeling strongly on this issue. Um, so what I need is a really strong community su support from the population towards their MP in each of their electorates. It's really important. Um, and, then, um, and then I also need business support because as we're seeing with the coronavirus, we need business to be healthy. We need jobs, we need the economy, we need things to be ticking over. Um, and for that to be happening, uh, they need to be mindful of their priorities. So I see businesses playing a big part in pushing the government towards committing to net zero. Um, but it's really important also for, um, for communities like yours to understand um, why it's so important for you, water security um, and, and regional development and better re equity between regional and city and urban areas is a really important part of the framework that I've put in the bill. Um, so that's, uh, so the, yeah, the goal is uh, to get a conscience vote or to push the government towards endorsing an, a, a net zero by 2050 policy and uh, a good plan towards it. Um, I should say a major element is having a climate change commission so that we have independent expert advice guiding or advising government. Now, we've seen the coalition government accept um, a hand-picked national co co uh, 
National um, Coronavirus Coordination Commission. Um, so clearly it's not ideologically opposed to the idea of a concept of a, an independent commission. Um, I would argue we need much broader expertise around the table. We need um, uh, more regional equity, generational equity, and we need better water and land and environment um, experts around the table. Uh, but they're really, um, really key elements. But I need everyone when we can come out of isolation to really, you know, up the ante for the core for, for stronger policy. Thank you, Zali. Um, <laughs> trouble is, <laughs> you uh, are answering the questions before I get to it read them out. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> I have another one here from Jack Egan uh, talking about regional community groups, of which he's a member of 350.org. Um, and he wanted to know how to help get your bill debated and passed, which you've just discussed. So I'm just wondering whether there's anything else in particular you would like uh, groups like his or Climate Action Monero to do? Uh, no, look, I think it's you're in a really a key moment as well. Um, it, it's easy to, you know, some, uh, there's been a bit of an interesting discussion of, oh, well, a by-election, it's, it's not a full election, so it's a by-election as a vital, or, but you, you create a huge, um, once someone is in as an incumbent, has an opportunity and a platform. Um, so it's a really key moment to, for the, your area to pick what its future is going to look like and to get engaged. Um, so community groups play a huge part, especially where you've got a bigger geographic footprint. You know, um, we know regional newspapers are getting shut down. Online communication is a huge part of it. Um, like I said at the beginning, for us in the election, you know, the website is our shop front. It's how I can communicate. Um, the amount of time spent on uh, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter is crazy um, but it's such an important tool that we own and you as a community group can own in terms of you can create your content you can get your message out the quick the more you grow your audience and membership the more impact you have and the more people you reach um, so you are, it is incredibly powerful and you know Australia is a country of compulsory votes, so every vote counts. Every person you talk to and convince is one step closer. So I know it's important sometimes to feel despairing, but don't. Um, there are great things happening, and I, I strongly believe every person you convince. You know, if every member here can speak to five people, and each of those people speak to another five. Elections are won or lost on several hundred votes, so it can make all the difference in the world. Very good. Um, now I have another, the next question from Anonymous. Uh, just not sure who that comes from, but it was, I was very, you might know Zali, but it was very involved in Zali's campaign. What does Zali see as the key contributor to her, to her uniting the Warringah community? Um, I think it was um, a, a, that it was time for um, a, a true representation, I think, hopefully with integrity, um, in that it was time for the issues that mattered to the, the electorate, that there was a promise that they were the issues that would get taken forward. Not a party line, not an overall view, but really local, specific, what matters to you, um, and to make sure that that's what is a priority. Um, I think it's time to be selfish, you know, uh, in terms of what's going to make a difference to your region. Um, and, and I think for, for Warringah, I think it was that sense of... Um, I think that was the attraction of an independent in that it was a change from major party. It was, it was, I would argue, sensible policies. Um, I'm, you know, I am pragmatic. I want a more collaborative style. I want there to be a, you know, I think we need to raise the bar in parliament a little bit. Um, uh, so I think it's, it, I think that was what appealed to many people in the electorate. It was more, you know, being more progressive on climate policy, more caring on 
issues like refugees um, and Black Lives Matter and, and Indigenous, you know, uh, constitutional recognition from the Uluru Statement. It was a number of issues like that. Um, what got look a lot of volunteers have written and stayed involved it was the being involved with something positive i think overwhelmingly um it was doing something for your future you know it can be very despairing in the climate um where you're really concerned about those impacts and it can really start to weigh on you that you know the frustration and anxiety about the future and the best way you can counter that is by feeling proactive that you're doing something about it. And I strongly believe everyone that came on board in the campaign knew or felt that they were doing something positive for the future. Um, very good. Um, now, I think I figured that out. It was from Julie Mills, that question. Um, now, the next one. Is... You, can't, you can't out her. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, she's outed herself in the, in the chat box. Um, now, the next question comes from Alex Cross of Jindabyne. In a rural town like Jindabyne, with so many climate change deniers, how do we get people to look at the science and the facts so we can actually make a change? Yeah, look, it's really, it's been an interesting part of, I think, my journey as well, has been trying to understand where people are coming from and why they believe what they believe. So is you know you've got to seek to understand before being understood so if people say they don't believe in climate change is it because of something they've read or do they just believe one type of newspaper or is it because they haven't personally experienced it or something contradicts it so if you can try and understand why they've formed that view you can start to peel back the layers of trying to point out you know maybe where um, they've you know misunderstood or misread or been misled by some information or show them or expose them to the information that is you know more widely acknowledged and accepted um, but also it's not about being stuck on labels so the problem with always talking about climate change and impacts is people sometimes you know have been have bought into the divisiveness so I would say in regional areas it's we'll talk about your personal experience on the land so have you have you do you think it's getting warmer uh, are the droughts longer do you feel like if you've got a dam on your property is the water in the dam getting back to the same levels or gradually is it getting lower um, do you think winters are getting longer or shorter are we having more extreme weather events or not um, i think there's some you know lived experience matters to people um, and I think goes a long way to convincing people of the need for more action and how it's going to personally impact them. So when you talk about climate change impacts and more better policy, if people feel that you're straight away talking about taking something away from them, they're going to get defensive and resist that. Okay. So it's really important to put it in where the opportunities are. Why is moving to a low emission economy and technologies what well, where are the opportunities for us as a nation and we have the opportunity to be absolutely leading the way on energy uh, we should have the goal of the lowest cost energy possible in the world and we have the means to do that with our environment so that's a very real thing for every individual person if we can say to you with you know the lowest cost energy possible production and if we keep going the way we are deflationary rate on renewables is huge it is the only energy source where the cost is going down so dramatically so if we continue going in that direction imagine what that will mean for you for your business for your industry um, so I think for people that don't believe, you've got to understand why. What is it? Is it because they think it's wedded to a left-right issue? Is it a liberal labour thing? Is it a conservative? Is it, oh, that's a greeny issue, I'm not going to go there? You've got to understand why to have that conversation. And, and you know, challenge the facts in a polite and respectful way. Um, I've sat down with Pauline Hanson. <laughs> um, I can't say I convinced her, but it was important to have the discussion. You have to talk about it. I've sat down with Barnaby Joyce. Um, because if we're going to bring everybody on board, or the vast majority of Australians on board, um, we all have to understand what is our common ground? What can we agree on? 
and then you know we we can build from there I, i'm a big believer in if we can start with what we all agree on and surely having a safe and livable environment should be our basic one uh, australians should be able to feel safe and uh we saw over the summer, we had the first climate refugees, you know, the population of Malakuta having to evacuate on the beach. That is not the Australia we want. That is not, uh, that, is, that does not make people feel safe. Um, so I think feeling safe should be one of those basic things we can all agree on. And how do we get to it? Very good. Um, now I have a question from Rachel. Um, just yell out to Ali if you, need a break or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it's not as bad as question time though. Um, Rachel has asked, which seats are you targeting or should we be targeting for people to cross the floor? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I I'm trying to encourage all of my colleagues in Parliament to, you know, elevate the issue. Uh, clearly, there are some seats where uh, climate concern is high. Uh, they do tend to be more urban seats uh, and they do tend to be seats held by the Liberal Party. <laughs> um, uh, and I think from their point of view, there's a real concern that what happened in Warringah can happen in other seats because um, I think that's very, you know, and that's a really real prospect that we do need more independent voices in Parliament. I think democracy is enhanced by having more viewpoints around the table, um, having a party room that stifles debate and keeps everything under wraps is not how we're going to get to better outcomes. Uh, in Parliament last week, we saw a number of times the coalition used the numbers in, on, in the House of Reps to gag the debate. So basically, they don't want to talk about something. And we're talking about things like, I was moving a motion um, on better packages for the arts and entertainment industry that have been decimated by the coronavirus. Now, this should not be controversial, but government can use their numbers to pass a motion that the, either the, the debate be adjourned to another day or that the member be um, no longer heard, which means a gag motion. Now, the way we counter that is by having, um, you know, a stronger, more members on the crossbench, which means that the major parties can't just get caught up in their games, and there's a lot of political games going on, but they actually have to engage in more productive, collaborative debate uh, and working through problems, coming up with solutions for the long term. Um, and I think that can only be good for democracy and, and for Australia. All right, so we're nearly out of time. Um, I have a bit of a strange question here. I'm not really sure where it's coming from, but Tony Fisk from the Melbourne Climate Action Group, ACF, has asked, environment and the economy is a false dichotomy. How do you present a policy or a bill as a win in both topics? Uh, I, I don't agree that it's a false dichotomy. I think, um, again, that's probably where we've gone wrong in the past. And that's why pitching one against the other has meant people have had to choose. Um, and as a result, you've really divided people in their priorities. And I think, sadly, they've felt that my economic situation is my pressing situation now. I will worry about the environment later. And as a result, I think a lot of people have sort of prioritize things and I don't think that's helpful. I think it's really important that the, the two are not uh, mutually exclusive, they actually work together. Um, because I think, you know, if we have a, a, a healthy environment, we have a more productive society. Um, I'm very concerned at the moment, the government talking about reducing red tape and green tape for the sake of accelerating um, industry and projects. Um, because that's a very short term, that's short termism, that's a short term gain with a long term impact. And we know those impacts will be there. Um, so I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I think they work together. I think um, if you look at the private sector, um, companies with strong ESG policies, so that's environmental, social governance, do better. They have stronger 
customer satisfaction, stronger shareholder satisfaction, and stronger employee satisfaction, which you've got to remember, employees need to feel uh, a strong sense that the company reflects the values that they want to work for. Um, so ESG policies is a growing, you know, is definitely gaining um, importance in, in sort of customer, you know, ratings for and opportunities. So um, I think the two go work together. Um, there's always going to be some give and take in certain areas, but um, I definitely don't think that you can ever have economic um, prosperity at the expense of environmental outcomes. Um, but at the same time, I'm not ideologically, you know, um, I am not, uh, I'm pragmatic, I guess, that there are, you know, we st we're still a modern society with, you know, no one is completely prepared to change their way of life. We're not going to turn the clock back 200 years. So we need to evolve to more sustainable um, policies and models of how we do combine economic and environmental policies. Um, and the beauty is we have the technology on so many areas. We have the technology now to be doing so much better. If anyone's seen the 2040 movie, it really shows how we already have the technology to get there. We just have to have the political will. All right, well, I've got two questions left. Um, well, time's just about run out, but one of them from Patricia is about, what do you know about Snowy Hydro 2? Um, look, I've had uh, representations from groups are very concerned about the environmental impact of Snowy Hydro uh, and I have been looking into that. Balanced with it is clearly there's a strong economic benefit to the region in terms of jobs and, um, and impacts um, and there's also what it represents in terms of long-term um, well, hydro being a clean and it, it, the storage capacity of a, a project of that size. Um, if we could turn back the clock three, four years, and would it be the most economic, environmental, sensible project compared to others? Possibly not, because I have been presented with the numbers and other projects that smaller, small, several small scale hydro projects would accomplish what Snowy 2.0 will accomplish without the same environmental impact and um, and cost because the cost is significant. Um, the difficulty is it's already very much uh, happening and it has got a, a strong impact for the community. So I, 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 ha I do appreciate the concerns and the difficulty, the encroachment into national parks that it represents is concerning. Um, yeah, it's a difficult one, but at the same time, it is going to provide a, a capacity of storage, which is significant in the overall scheme of things. Right, so, all right, well, we might um, call it a day there. Um, I do have a question that I will get to um, from David Mitchell, uh, but it's not for you, Zali. <laughs> So, so you can relax, but it, um, it just so happens that David asked a question about, um, if I can find it here somewhere, about uh, how much we would have to lower our methane emissions in the livestock industry to be back at 1990 levels. I can't find the question, it's in here somewhere. Uh, but anyway, the long, and the long and the short of it is that I did ask Bill Hare on Thursday what the answer to this question was because David wrote to us earlier and Bill felt that we would have to do it by about 40 percent um, which isn't such a big ask these days because uh, there's a lot of research going on with MLA and various other places and if we used many of the techniques of increased genetics carbon sequestering in the soil planting trees doing a whole lot of other things he felt uh, that we would get to uh, carbon neutral by required time. So um, hope that satisfies you, Bill. Um, yeah. I, mean, I should but, say I've had that conversation with someone just today about all right. the challenge in agriculture of how do we lower emissions in agriculture. But, you know, the starting point has to be we need to all be focused on the problem. 
you know, there's no point on doing nothing for 10 years and then being faced with it really dramatically. Um, there is going to be an impact on um, the uh, on livestock, on beef and on milk production um, down, down the road in terms from an emission point of view. Um, and so the question is, how do we prepare those sectors and people whose livelihood depends on those, in those sectors for additional or, or um, income streams so that if the market changes over time and it is likely to, um, so that people aren't left stranded without income. So this is where the partnerships agreements, where you've got alternate uses of land, where you've got additional uses of land. So, you know, sheep grazing under solar panels, um, wind farms on properties, but still having livestock. These are all things that work together and it ensures for regional producers to have that additional stream of income. And I think that's really important. And if you have... You know, if we if we sort of all deny that this isn't something we need to deal with in the future, there's a real risk that people won't be prepared and will be exposed. So I'm a big fan that we need to plan for these. We need to acknowledge what the challenges are going to be and how do we plan for them and how do we mitigate them. Um, and so that's, that, you know, agriculture is not an easy sector to decarbonise, but just because it's not easy doesn't mean we shouldn't be focusing on it and investing the time and money to find the solutions. Thank you, Zali. I think that might nearly do us for the evening. Uh, I'll throw back to uh, Jenny to um, wrap the night up and any closing words that she might have to say, but it's, uh, it's been really interesting from my point of view, sitting here trying to work this out. So thank you very much, Zali. Thank you for having me. And I love that you have so many different generations. I can see on my screens that you've got all age groups here watching, and that is fantastic. Thanks, Sally. It's been a real privilege to have you and a, and a great pleasure. We've all learned a lot, and uh, we're very grateful to you for giving up an hour of your very, very valuable time. So thank you. And thank you to all the other participants who joined us tonight. Um, I know there was competition uh, with the candidates meeting, um, but it was great to have you all. So thank you very much. I hope we can do this again sometime. My thanks to um, Joe Oddy and Peter Holding from, uh, well, Joe's on my committee, but she's also uh, with Farmers for Climate Action. And um, they basically did all the technical work tonight. So thank you. Joe is about to share screen um, where she will put up the um, websites of um, the two organisations. I hope you'll go to those websites and perhaps join them. So, uh, Joe, can you do that and put, share your screen? And um, there you go. Uh, so there you go. Thank you. And um, good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, well, thanks everybody from. From our point of view at Farmers for Climate Action, it's been a it's been a really great night, and we love working with local community groups like Climate Action Monero to uh, drive climate action further. And uh, thanks everybody for attending. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>